We've got Dr. Coley joining us. Yes. Also, Pierce Brosnan. Right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's looking a lot better. It's getting better day yeah. by day. Looks good. If you had like a little like brown hat, you would be Indy. Indiana Jones. Yes. Indy. You just switch, you just him you Indy. switch characters. <laughs> or anybody with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, today we are going to start with actually quite the alarming report. The American Psychological Association is demanding social media platforms make serious changes to protect kids. Dr. Coley, I want to read you this quote from the APA's chief science officer. He says social media platforms know that the answer to structurally correct harmful design features and functions. Most children and, ad and adolescents lack the experience, judgment, and self-control to manage their behaviors on these platforms, which is why we see over 50% reporting at least one symptom of clinical dependency on social media today. So Dr. Coley, in your medical opinion, what does this report tell you? I mean, it's shocking. 50% of our kids are addicted to social media. And we're talking about the psychological impact that it has, but it actually has a physiologic impact as well. So there was a really famous study in JAMA Pediatrics that came out last year that looked at the brains of sixth and seventh graders who were checking their social media all day long, just like what we do. And guess what it found? That the parts of their brain involved in fear response, the parts of their brain involved in judgment, actually had a change in blood flow. Wow. And it found that their sensitivity to social criticism had gone up. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, we have this kind of social media designed for adults, designed to be addictive. Every time you get a like, it's a little dopamine hit, right? Every time we get followers, look at me, I've got another follower, a little dopamine hit. Now we're targeting our kids at a vulnerable time where their brain is developing. So to me, this is a really wake up call about not just the behavioral impact, but the physiologic impact. What does this mean for our kids in 10 or 20 years? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, I would been say, talking about this. yeah, I would say that that's for all ages, not just the young kids, but they're more vulnerable, obviously. But a lot of responsibility for protecting kids on social media, I talk about it all the time, is left up to the parents. What does this say about that? I mean, I would say like three of you guys up here are parents. You know, of course the parents do have some responsibility, right? They should limit the screen time. They should talk to their teen or tween, and I'm talking even the eight to 12, which is the tween age group, about how they're using social media. And if you're a grandparent, you should do the same. How they get information, what's accurate, what isn't. This is something called social media literacy. So you teach your child how to interact with social media, not just believe everything that they see. You teach your child about cyberbullying. You teach your child about ways in which it could impact their behavior and you observe their behavior. If they're more happy with the device than they are going to see a friend, these are signs that something's going wrong. So parents have some responsibility, but I also think that putting it all on the parents is really kicking the can down the road. We have to hold these social media companies accountable. And what we've done as a society is given them free reign to do whatever they want with no regulations, with no consequences, knowing that it's impacting our children, not just the way that they're behaving, but their their development, I think it's time to speak up and say something. Amen, well said. Well, we're gonna get to another topic because a new Gallup poll found that Americans are sleeping less and are stressing out more. And this is especially true with women. So what is this all about? Yeah, I mean, our society has sort of taken over. So part of this is obviously the screen time and some of the things we've been talking about. But, you know, as a woman, I feel like we have it hard enough already. There's a gender gap in pay. There's a gender gap in the medical care we receive. And now even the amount of sleep that we're getting, which really chips away at our biology and our health in the long term. And some of this is by biological. You know, we have our menstrual cycle, we have menopause, we have all these different things that can impact our quality and quantity of sleep. But a large part of this is societal and cultural. Women take on too much. We as women assume the caregiver role and we're much more willing than our gentlemen colleagues up here to sacrifice our sleep for others. And, and I think that that's something that we have to take notice of so that we can try to change it. Because if we keep along this trend, ladies, we're sleeping a lot less than we did a decade ago. Mm -hmm. We are setting ourselves up for chronic health problems including cancer heart disease and dementia yeah I mean that's one thing that I have learned from this one over here is Erica is you prioritize your sleep which is something I do I not also don't have kids yeah, so no, like, well <laughs> I, some could argue you've raised me since like season three <laughs> I would really I'm dead serious and we all know it's kind of true uh, but uh, you know dr. Coley what you're describing is really a cycle like a vicious cycle so how do we break that 
you, you're so right, Al. I mean, I have nights once a week where I'm like, I'm so stressed out that I can't wind down. Mm -hmm. My mind yes. is still going. And then I get stressed about not sleeping, which causes me more stress and anxiety. So I think, I mean, all of us fall victim to this. We have bad sleep hygiene. And any of you guys watch TV in bed or? No. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. No? no? Only curb your enthusiasm, which I think is exempt for Jeff. Yeah. So <laughs> I watch TVL asleep. in bed. Yeah. When I miss it, I, I come home and stream it at night. That's right. <laughs> but think about what I'm doing. I'm stimulating my retina. I'm giving myself light. So I'm triggering my brain to release stress hormones that wake me up rather than sleep hormones like melatonin. So what we need to do is gaslight our brains into sleeping better when we're stressed. And the way to do that is to follow some behavioral patterns. So really good sleep hygiene, going to bed at the same time. We up at the same time, no alcohol or caffeine, no devices within two hours of bedtime, no workouts within three hours of bedtime, no large meals within a few hours of bedtime because that triggers all the heartburn and all the other things that can keep us awake. And if we do all this, it's so much better than sleep aids because those sleep aids are habit forming. They destroy the quality and the architecture of your sleep. So you may be sleeping, but you're not getting good quality sleep. Man. Wow. To know. Sometimes I get scared when I'm at my house. I'm like, Dr. Coley could see me now. <laughs> not be happy. I, I'm seeing you. I'm watching. Smoke oh. meat right before I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then you wanted to talk to us about a poll. What yes. is this poll? And so I'm really curious to hear your guys, what you react, because they did a poll of over 2,000 Britishers, and they asked them, what is the time of day that you are the most stressed? So I want to hear your answers. Mornings, getting the kids ready for school, making lunches, breakfast, dressing them, meltdowns, listening the to the morning meeting, getting here on time. Yeah. That's so true. Say, yeah. I would say same for me. Any, any night stressors here? I I would say I'm a night, uh, night and morning, which is weird because at night I All have, day. I'm not, honestly, because at shows, uh, at night I have shows, so I'll go out and do a show or eight and 10, you don't get, you get off stage 10, 30, uh, 1130, you don't get home till uh, midnight. So I'm like, I'm not getting enough sleep and in the morning. I'm like, I have a ton of stuff to do. So it just kind of, I'm getting it on both ends, but I think most adults have a second gig. Right. So I think mm -hmm. that there's part of that. Yeah. yeah. So 815 AM is when most people said they were stressed and no surprise there, right? Because not only are stress hormones turned up in the morning because the light triggers our stress hormones, cortisol, to get us up and out of bed, get us all the things we need to do in the morning, but also our behavior is driven such that we've got a mountain to climb. We've got all the day ahead of us. But for people like Al, who might have, you know, work at night or might have other jobs or come home and take care of the kids as well, like you guys do, I'm sure that there's sort of a a bimodal right. stress peak. And that really illustrates how much stress has penetrated our lives and how much we have to be mindful to disconnect it. Because we think stress is helpful, right? We think, oh, it gets us going, it gets us doing things, but it's burning us out. Right. If we're working at this level all the time, it's really not adaptive, it's maladaptive. Right. And Jeff, your mornings are so stressful that you forgot to shave today. <laughs> <laughs> She is loving this all week. That's get them in, get them in all week. Okay. Wait till baby face Schroeder rolls in. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Coley. DBL Nation, follow Dr. Coley on social media at Pyle Coley MD. Also be sure to subscribe to her YouTube page. Plus check out her podcast, Heart of Medicine, wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you again.